there are over two billion school-aged individuals living in the world today. That's more young people than any other time in human history. And it's this generation's creativity, their actions, their art, their poetry, their protests, their questions, their code, their dreams. It's this generation's ideas that will define the future of our world. One well-articulated idea can reach and inspire millions. That's why TED's youth and education initiative, TED-Ed, has created a program that's dedicated to sparking and celebrating the best ideas of young people around the world. The essence of TED-Ed was to create more confident individuals. It was our club, it was run by us and it was for us. The program is called TED-Ed Clubs. It supports students in identifying their passions, learning public speaking skills, connecting with a global network of classrooms, and sharing student ideas in the form of short, TED-style talks. Here's how it works. Participating students and teachers gain access to a free and flexible curriculum they can use to start a TED-Ed club at their school. Each suggested meeting uses TED Talks to help students engage in critical thinking exercises and gain invaluable presentation skills. In the final meeting, students are invited to give their own TED Talk, and if they record their talk, they can upload it to TED-Ed's award-winning platform, where it can be referenced on a resume, a college application, and shared with participating clubs around the world. Over two billion young people empowered and encouraged to share their ideas. Imagine that future and bring TED-Ed clubs to your community today. I'm trying to hold my breath Let it stay this way Can't let this moment end You set off a dream in me Getting louder now Can you hear it echoing? Take my hand, oh, you share this with me, cause darling, without you, all oh, the shine of a thousand spotlights, all oh, the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough, never be enough. Hours of gold is still too little. These hands go over the world, but it'll never be enough. Never be enough for me. Never, 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 never for me.
Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Imagine, imagine un mot sans combat. Imagine étudier dehors les murs d'école. Imagine une société sans biais gendaire. Imagine comment nous connectons autour du monde. Bienvenue, Bienvenue à, à nos 2022 TEDx events. Wow, look at this stage. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. I mean, like... Oh wait, did you hear what those guys did? Oh yeah, those were two of Meadowhall students asking us to reimagine in French. Really? Oh, I think yeah. Meadowhall really does support foreign languages here. Yeah. Yes, definitely. They are preparing their students for the world. Good day everyone and welcome to this year's edition of TEDx Youth and Meadowhall Lecky 2022. Themed Reimagine. So we welcome you, sit back, relax, and enjoy each and every one of these talks as you get in insightful ideas from each of our students. So make sure you digest all the useful nuggets and watch out for more. At this point, we would like to welcome our head of school, Mrs. Obafusui. It's an absolute delight and pleasure to welcome you to this edition of our TEDx event themed Reimagine. As we listen to our dynamic students reimagine, reconsider, reevaluate, or reexamine, I'm sure that our reflections will demonstrate how much the world today has been and is being reimagined. We must acknowledge this to sustain our relevance in the world. Sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Obafusunye, for that exquisite welcome. Last year, we hosted our premier TEDx event with the theme, Explore. It was indeed an amazing experience with student speakers from Nigeria, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. Let us have a quick recap. Welcome to TEDx Youth and Meadowhall Lekki. I always say that the best time to learn programming is when you are very young. Education is the best currency for the better future. If your mistake is that big, how much bigger and greater beside of your success be? If you, you and you and even I start treating women equally, we can put an end to gender inequality. Today, I see that being second best is not such a bad thing. I see that being second best helped me push myself to not just be my sister's sister, not just to be my father's daughter, but to be myself. We firstborns tend to have a fear of failure because we think that whatever we accomplish is never good enough. It's this generation's creativity, their action, their arts, their poetry, their questions, their dreams that would define the future of our world. Last year was indeed an amazing TEDx event. I look forward to seeing how this one turns out. Can you imagine? Meadow Hall was featured in TED Ed's 2021 video recap, highlighting a few talks from students across the world. 
distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let us sit back, relax, and enjoy as we listen to one of Meadow Hall's finest students, Chisom's talks on the future of online learning. The 2020 global coronavirus pandemic is a defining moment in history, bringing the 21st century lifestyle to a standstill and causing pain, suffering, and death to thousands. In the midst of this pandemic, the world's largest homeschooling experiment is taking place. Over one billion students worldwide are participating in some form of virtual learning as a precaution to stifle infection rates. Now, with the various online learning tools that have popped up in recent months and the rapid innovation taking place in sectors like 5G technology and mobile devices, not to mention the declining gap of the digital divide that allows people from poor regions of the world to access more digital devices, it raises the following questions. Is in-person learning sustainable? Are we moving to a new era of learning? Will online slash virtual learning become the new normal? What will school systems look like in years to come? Innovation in the academic institutions around the world are currently moving at a snail's pace. With century-old lecture-based approaches to teaching, entrenched institutional biases, and outdated classrooms. However, COVID-19 has become a catalyst for educational institutions worldwide to search for innovative solutions in a relatively short period of time. For example, in most parts of the world, millions of students got access to learning materials through online television broadcasts. Multiple apps like Zoom, Google Meet, and Microsoft Teams have integrated easier interfaces for full-time online learning. In my school, for example, we were able to complete two full terms online successfully. Online learning has created a world where students can learn from anywhere at any time and have readily available access to all materials and even improve on their tech skills in this ever-growing tech world. Online learning is even contributing in aiding our world's current issues. With overpopulation looming in the near future and standard classroom sizes are becoming implausible, online learning has proved, that, has proved to be a solution that can be implemented for future generations to receive quality education. With no need for students to commute or drive to school, carbon emissions will plummet, helping reducing global warming. Online learning is imminent in our society today and to soon take over all of the educational sector. But does this mean that old physical system will become obsolete, replaced by its virtual counterpart? The problem then arises when we're talking about the social aspect of learning. Humans are not robots. We are social creatures. School is more than a building. It is part of the social fabric of our children's lives. Many social and behavioral skills are learned through interactions with teachers and children at school. Without it, many children will grow up lacking important skills, such like effective communication, conflict resolution, active listening, collaboration, teamwork, and most importantly, empathy. As schools close their doors, many educators have turned to online learning and students' technologies to fill the void left by classrooms. It is also creating a deepening inequality between those who have the tools to access the materials and those who don't. Children without a stable internet connection or electronic devices fall far behind in their education compared to their well-off counterparts. This creates a social and psychological divide, and it is a clear example of the digital divide affecting many in Asia and Africa. Can we really transition to full online learning with all the social and psychological downsides? Well, we are already seeing the online future. Many schools and universities are now giving full online options. The world is changing, and COVID-19 is the catalyst. We cannot keep using an ancient method to teach future generations. Like Abraham Maslow once said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. Online learning is the future. There is no doubt about that. But in this new future, is there space for traditional physical learning? And that's the real question. Amatala Mokiedo, in her TED Talk titled Double Standard Parenting, Concerns of the Girl Child. In recent times, when female equality is being addressed in the Western world, the question she asks is what happens to the African girl child? In her young years, she has lived in different parts of the United States and moved to Nigeria where she witnessed first-hand cultural differences in raising children of different sexes and its impact on the society. Her diverse upbringing has positioned her world to have this visionary discussion from the viewpoint of a young African girl child. Join me as we welcome to the stage Omotila Omakiedo and her talk titled double standard parenting.
The word double standards is usually said in relation to gender equality. Double standards simply means a difference in principle between two groups or people. It is, what, it is when what is seen as acceptable for one group is not seen as acceptable for the other and vice versa. Double standard parenting is a difference in parenting styles between girls and boys and a difference in values instilled into them. A girl's value is usually measured by how well they can cook or clean. Girls are taught to be quiet and emotional, while boys, on the other hand, are taught to be loud, proud, and play sports. Boys playing rough sports is something praised and accepted in society, which causes it to be something that many boys aim to do and feel less than when they can't do it. While when a girl does rough sports, it's something seen as unladylike or inappropriate. It is something not encouraged from childhood for them because parents don't want them to sustain any injuries, which is not seen as an issue for boys. The values instilled at a young age form the way we operate as adults. Double standards like this are the reason we have so many drastic statistics today. About 80 to 90% of people with eating disorders, such as bulimia and anorexia, are women. One of the re main reasons for eating disorders is low self-esteem or body image issues. As children, girls are taught to put very high values in their looks and size. Small comments such as, you need to wear this so you can look pretty, or it is important to value your beauty, causes girls to fixate on their appearances which in turn causes them to grow up to be insecure women that think all they have to give the world is their beauty. For boys, double standard parenting affects them as well. Learning that emotions are a sign of weakness or that it is not manly to cry affects them in the long run. When boys are encouraged to be rough and tough, but discouraged to be emotional and feminine, this causes them to be less attached to their emotions as adults. We as humans are emotional beings. Emotions help us make decisions that care for both ourselves and others. Not being taught to be emotionally competent can be linked to how most violent crimes are done by men. About 90% of homicides worldwide are committed by men. This statistics is an example of how double standard parenting affects boys' moral standpoints. As a child myself, I noticed these subtle differences in my environment how it is shocking that the boy can cook anything past Indomie, or how a girl always has to be perfect and clean at all times. I see how in families it is a daughter that is clean and put to high standards, while the sons get told the same phrase, boys will be boys. I watch as my friends complain about how they are treated differently from their brothers and how it takes a toll on them mentally. It's not just me that notices these things as a child. When I asked a group of people in my class, I got similar data. Girls said that they had experienced double standard parenting in forms of preferential treatments, teaching of different skills such as cooking, and putting girls and boys in different standards. All of them agreed that double standard parenting with a wi with widespread issue that negatively affected both boys and girls. In the long run, one of them even brought up a valid point of how parents teach us contradicting views. They teach daughters to be smaller and fear men, while they teach boys to be unapologetic and free. Teaching girls to be small and repress themselves, in her opinion, adds on to how a majority of people with anxiety are women. Another girl talked on culture and how in Igbo culture, it is the boy that is favored and seen as expected in the family. She thinks this causes parents to neglect their daughters. In total, they all came to the same base point, that parents need to discard this primitive way of double standard parenting and raise their children equally. On the other hand, the boys I interviewed noticed these standards as well. They said it was a relevant and widespread issue and noticed how the guys are expected to do more physical activities like sports and encouraged to be more manly and brave. While girls are taught to be feminine and wear skirts, they understood how it, is negative, it negatively affects both gender. They wanted to say how they know that parents think that they are doing the right thing, but in total, it is usually a harmful practice. In Nigeria, we cannot ignore the prevalence and normalization of double standard parenting. With religious and cultural implications, it is seen as expected for the girls to be quiet and listen to men, that the boys are seen as weak to, as, as weak to cry and get upset. When we grow up, this culture is taught and passed down from generation to generation. 
but it needs to stop due to how harmful it is to, our, to us youths. I know many people would ask, why is it so necessary to speak up about this? Too many people think it is an invisible issue that doesn't cause problems, although something as important and complex as parenting ne needs to be talked about. Parents form the future with their children. Unlearn unlearning harmful ways to raise them makes a better future for all. It's not as if this is impossible or needs a lot of work. It's just you as parents putting the effort to unlearn these harmful traits and to be more mindful of how you raise us. For example, you can encourage daughters to do sports or look towards other hobbies. You can teach them values that don't have harmful implications. And you can be more mindful about what you say to your sons and daughters. And most importantly, you can teach your son how to make anything past Indomie or egg. I'm Omosla Mokiyoto, and thank you for listening to my TED Talk. What a beautiful talk from Omotala. How's it at your family? Hmm. I can definitely say I see some similarities between what she shared and how it is in my home. There are definitely different expectations for boys and girls. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. How's it at your home? Ophirosa Ehiha Williams is a gritty, resourceful, self-directed and gifted year 8 student at Meadow Hall College. She consistently topped her class through primary school, becoming the school valedictorian at graduation, and she attained the academic best in college award in her first year of secondary school. Apart from her dedication to academics, Ophirosa is a member of the school choir and swimming team and is actively exploring her other passions in crafts, cooking, speaking, writing, playing the piano, and gymnastics. As a creative thinker, she has represented her school at nationwide ASEAN debates and has spoken on global stages such as COBIS. Ophirosa enjoys writing and has been writing stories since she was four years old. She is currently working toward publishing her first book. Her talk is on the mindful use of social media. I read lots of stories in the news about people killing other people and using their body parts for money rituals, people spreading fake news all around the world, and people injuring themselves badly or even dying because of so-called trends that they do. But what's the cause of all this and what aids it? Social media. Recently, I read a story on the Punch newspaper about some teenage boys who were supposedly influenced by social media that burned the head of another human being for money rituals in Ogun State, Southwest Nigeria. That is the kind of thing that happens when people choose to use social media mindlessly. www.famemass.com says the average teenager spent three hours and one minute on social media each day in 2021, while the average adult spends two hours and 24 minutes per day. This adds up to 44 days a year on social media for teenagers and about 37 days a year for adults. Some teenagers even spend up to nine hours of their day on social media which is 137 days, about 15 days more than a third of a year. www.famous.com also tells us that Nigeria on the whole spent the third most time on social media in 2021, three hours and 36 minutes each day, just below Philippines and Brazil. This time does not include the time people spend on screens doing other things such as school or work-related stuff, gaming and the like. We need to be able to use social media mindfully in such a way that we don't hurt others or we don't get hurt ourselves. That's where being positively social comes in. According to Isa for Erebo, a positive psychology coach, being positively social is a way of engaging with social media and technology mindfully. In this way, we notice and acknowledge the good and challenging parts of using it. We notice how it impacts us, others, and our community, and we choose how we engage with it to stay well function optimally and meet our goals. Someone that's positively social is a person that is an informed, mindful, and purposeful user of social media and the world of technology. What is challenging about social media? What's right about it? How is my use impacting me, others, and my community? What's my aim? What do I want to achieve today as I use social media, and who do I want to be? According to a research study from IDC in 2019, about 80% of smartphone users check their mobile phones within 15 minutes of waking up each morning. Of course, with the current COVID-19 situation on our hands, this number would have greatly increased as almost everything on our, in our lives happens online now. This means that the more time we spend offline, the more we miss out. 
Because of this, we barely sleep so we don't miss out on anything while we're sleeping. We spend a large chunk of our lives checking for updates from our friends, messages, calls, texts, and notifications. Is social media really worth all the attention that we give to it? How does social media impact us when we use it negatively and what can we do about it? Social media contributes to sleep deprivation when it's used mindlessly. When the COVID-19 pandemic started and we had to commence online learning, my friends and I created a group chat so we could still keep in touch. My friends spend their entire day chatting and even most of their nights. Most of the time, they would finally stop chatting at about 3 o'clock in the morning and they would still do other things before sleeping. This meant they slept at about 4 o'clock and those same people wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get ready for school the next day, getting only an hour of sleep. That completely disrupts that sleep cycle. And before you know it, that was what their body clock was used to. Some people would even wake up really early at about 3 o'clock and chat until it's time to start getting ready for school. Even though that gives you more than an hour's sleep, it's still bad for you. When social media is used mindlessly, it completely disrupts your sleep cycle and changes your body clock. When I say body clock, I mean the schedule that your body follows. It includes things you do daily, such as eating, sleeping, waking up, and the like. This schedule is formed by repeatedly doing something. For example, if you sleep at 7, 11 o'clock each night, your body clock will automatically mark up 11 o'clock for sleeping. Social media usage is not the only thing that may keep you at, awake at night, but according to www.sleepfoundation.org, about 70% of people report using social media after getting into bed, and about 15% of people spend an hour or more on it each night. Social media also lowers self-esteem and self-image when it's used mindlessly. This can lead to a higher risk of self-harm. Whether online or offline, we have a natural tendency to compare ourselves to others based on different qualities we believe we should have or society believes we should have. When we compare ourselves to people who we feel are lesser than us, we feel better. When we compare ourselves to people who we feel are superior to us, we feel bad and lowers our self-esteem. This comparison is still there in the fiscal world, but having access to social media makes everything worse because you can check it at any time, wherever you are, once you have internet access. The truth is, People sometimes post unreal images online to impress others. Then we start feeling bad and making ourselves miserable because of a picture online that may not even be real. We start feeling depressed and inferior because of something we saw or something someone told or sent to us. We compare ourselves and compare ourselves and compare ourselves until we don't even have a sense of self-worth anymore. When we then feel that everybody is better than us in every way, then we begin to doubt ourselves. Our self-esteem keeps getting lower and so does the image we have of ourselves. Then some people don't even have, feel like they don't even have a reason to live anymore. So what do they do? People hurt themselves or people make wrong decisions that could affect them badly later in life. They do this just because someone or some people posted things and they felt intimidated by it. The good opinion they had of themselves had been shattered. Social media increases the rate of peer pressure and fear of missing out, also known as FOMO, in teenagers and youth, making them do things they wouldn't normally have done. A lot of times we do things on social media just for our social benefits or because other people are doing it. For example, TikTok trends like the milk crate challenge. People fell and injured themselves badly because they felt like they had to accept the challenge. People fell off places 10 tall crates high, wearing no protective garments whatsoever. They hit their head, broke their wrists, arms, legs, and backs, dislocated their shoulders, and fractured bones in various parts of their bodies. Some people even went as far as trying to do the channel while riding a bicycle and wearing extremely high heels. Then there was also the fire challenge where people poured rubbing alcohol into a plastic jugger bottle, then set it on fire to make a whoosh sound. According to www.kktv.com, the East Heaven Fire Department says a teenager was badly burned while attempting it. www.distractify.com also tells us that a 13-year-old girl landed in the ICU with severe burns on her neck and arms after participating in this challenge. Then some trends even resulted in death, such as the Benadryl Challenge and the Blackout Challenge. But why do people do these challenges anyway? to prove they can do the challenge, to get themselves more likes, to get themselves more followers, to break a record, to fit in with everyone else and follow the crowd. Social media aids bullying when it's not used appropriately. 
Miriam Webster Dictionary defines bullying as abuse and mistreatment to someone vulnerable by someone stronger or more powerful. Bullying is intimidating someone because of things they have done, should have done, or looked, judged by your own personal yardsticks. Sometimes people bully other people because they feel they're superior, even for no reason at all. Now, there's something called cyberbullying, which is just all of this, but doing it online. It includes bullying through texting, calls, emails, and other social media platforms. According to www.comparatech.com, about one-fifth of all bullying occurs through social media. In addition to low self-esteem and self-image, cyberbullying also contributes to self-harm, such as suicides, in fact, more teen suicides are not attributed in a way to cyberbullying than they have ever been before. Imagine these. You post a video and hate comments flood your comment section. You suddenly get a cruel message from someone you don't even know. Someone calls you just to bully you for whatever reason. And all these continue over and over again. The problem is, we tend to think more of the terrible things that happen than of the good ones. So these vile thoughts remain at the back of our minds in every point in time and the bully continues eventually you begin to think that everything they're saying is true even when it's not you may begin to doubt yourselves and make wrong decision according to www.firstguide.com 41 percent of people who were cyber bullied develop social anxiety and 37 percent of them develop depression 25 percent harm themselves 14 percent developed eating disorders and 9% abuse drugs or alcohol and a lot more. But what do drugs and alcohol have to do with cyberbullying? It's probably because those substances make you feel better for a while before the reality of the world kicks in again. That way, victims of cyberbullying feel better about themselves for a while. But abusing drugs and alcohol has a negative long-term impact on people. Not only victims of cyberbullying experience this too, www.projectno.com says teens who bully their peers are more likely to use alcohol, marijuana, and cigarettes compared to students who don't bully others. Both the bully and the victim are negatively impacted by cyberbullying. Then there is cyberstalking, which is another effect of mindless use of social media. Cyberstalking is the use of the internet to harass or stalk another person. There are several types of cyberstalking. Webcam hijacking involves tricking you into downloading an infected file that grants them access to your webcam. Observing lo check location check-ins on social media is another way cyberstalkers can monitor your location. They just have to check your social media profile. Catfishing is when internet stalkers make fake profiles on social media and approach their victims as a friend or someone they know. They even hack into your social media accounts to find your personal information. With these, Cyberstalkers can get all the information they want about you, and you may not even notice. Then they begin to call you, email you, text you, and contact you by other means. They use all the information they have obtained to bully you for their gains and sometimes to track your physical location. Mindless use of social media also decreases the attention students pay to schoolwork. How? You're supposed to be studying, but every five minutes you switch on your phone to see if someone texted you, called you, or posted something. At the end of the day, you would have spent more time of social media than on studying. When you do that repeatedly, your grades will begin to drop. Then there's also the instance of using social media during lessons. Some schools allow devices in school and intend them to be used for emergency purposes, schoolwork, or during breaks. But some students abuse that and use it during classes instead. A study shows that 95% of students bring their phones to school. Of that 95%, 92% have used their phone to text a message at least once or twice during a class, with 30% admitting to doing this daily. 10% of students have admitted to having texted during an exam at least once. Lastly, mindless use of social media um, exposes teenagers to predators, and this could pose a huge risk. A stranger sends you a message on social media, and you believe that the friendly thing to do is to reply. You don't know who this person is, their gender, their age, or anything about them, but you text them back anyway. According to www.coa.com, federal investigators believe that there are more than 500,000 predators active each day, and they have multiple online profiles. More than 50% of victims are aged 15, 12 to 15, and 19 and 89% of victims are contacted by online predators through chat rooms and instant messaging. Most of the time, 
predators pose as someone you think is your age when they are nowhere near that age range. And once you start chatting with them, they will keep on chatting with you and intimidating you. And you will believe that they are like you. They are not. Most of the time, predators ask the child to meet in person and they send the addresses since they consider this predator's friends. So, knowing all this, how can you use social media more mindfully? First off, no matter how much someone threatens you, says hurtful things or pressures you, don't intimidate or bully other people and don't let anyone intimidate or bully you. Next, keep to your values. Let the good values that you learn from the very beginning of your life stay with you. Values such as honesty, love, kindness, trustworthiness, truthfulness and the like. To help keep your body clock at a healthy sleeping time, set specific times for sleeping and waking up and do not let social media disrupt these. If it helps, put away all gadgets during your sleeping time. In addition, do not answer strangers and block or even report their profiles. Though some people may prove stubborn and keep contacting you using different profiles, do not stop blocking them. Never give out your personal information to anyone, phone numbers, home or work or school addresses, emails, ID numbers and stuff like that. Never download anything you don't know about, visit sites you don't know about or click on any adverts. I'm not saying that social media is a bad place. It has a lot of positives even though there are negatives. You just have to use it mindfully and remember to be positively social. I like to end with a quote by Y. Keen. Social media is a double-edged sword. It has the power to do real good but also the power to hurt. Which side of the sword will you use and which side would you let others use on you? Thank you. So at this point in the program, we're going to be starting something very interesting. So I'm going to read out a question and we'll take the first correct response. So to our online audience, you can just type it out in the chat section and our administrator will be looking out for whoever responds first. Okay, so here's the question. If tomorrow I said the day before yesterday was Saturday, which day is today? So you have five seconds to respond. So let's see who gets the correct answer. So let's start.
David Oladeju is a creative thinker known amongst his teachers and peers for his literacy powers. Through his writing, he seeks to advocate for change and gives voices to those who have none. His creative pieces have been published in various magazines, newsletters, and websites, including Mavin, Teen Inc., and Enercise and Head Stories from around the world. He's a Queen's Commonwealth bronze medalist and a National Asia Debate semi-finalist. Having been to over nine schools throughout the course of his life, David has developed an interest in student learning patterns and global curriculum. In his free time, you'd find him singing, jamming to Spotify, reading or writing. Watch out for David's premier bestseller, Buried Past, coming out soon. Join me as we welcome David Oladejo as he shares the traditional school system. Global statistics have shown that a typical student goes to school from around 8 in the morning till 3 later in the afternoon for 180 days a year. That's roughly 7 hours a day or 1,260 hours in a year. Fast forward down the line after completing kindergarten through grade 12 and they would have spent 18,720 hours at school. Now, that isn't any small number, yet why is it that so many students complain of not having gained mastery in the subject they truly care about, and they feel less competent and confident in pursuing their higher education? Well, my name is Ola Dejo David, I'm almost through grade 11, and here's what I've been up to with my 18,720 hours. I enrolled in primary school at the tender age of four, ready to embrace a new chapter of my life. At that point, I'd learned that education was the key to success, and so I was ready to take the bull by the horns and spare no effort. Prize given day at the end of first grade remains one of my most cherished childhood memories. I had received an award for coming up as the best overall student in my grade that year. But more than just an achievement or a moment of recognition, this event was a spark of curiosity that lit up my spirit. A seed of ambition that reminded me of where I wanted to go. A reaffirmation of my dream. And I've got to say, it didn't come easy. I'd learned to cram, memorize, and regurgitate. The skills I then thought were the most important in securing success for the future. Here I was, four foot one, bold and daring, ready to explore and discover with a world awaiting for me to conquer. Midway through second grade, my family relocated all the way to Canada. Now, due to the new grade age requirement system, I bumped back down to grade one. Of course, I took this news pretty badly. It was a sign of demotion, a stumbling block to my pursuit of excellence. I had to find more ways to challenge myself, or I would fall out of line with my peers back in Nigeria. Over time, though, I began to enjoy the experience. Now, in second grade, there was a particular day in which our class teacher announced that we students will be carrying out individual research projects on our favorite animals. That day, I ran home as quickly as I could, eager to get started on mine. This was my area of speciality. This was where I thrived. The next day, however, our class teacher handed out these fill-in-the-blank worksheets with headings like name, color, average size, average lifespan, prey, predators, fun facts. And at first, I thought it was just an outline to guide us through our project work till I realized that, hey, this was our actual project. I was left completely dumbfounded. I always wanted to do some exploration, discovery, and research, but now I couldn't go beyond this paper. Isn't this so similar to what happens in schools today? As students, our learning is often restricted to that of our teachers, exam syllabuses, curriculum guides, and just like my research project in grade two, we can't seem to ever go beyond the page. During the spring season in third grade, after a series of exams referred to as gifted testing, I received an invitation to attend a gifted school, and I was fascinated with the whole gifted concept, and I couldn't wait to see what was next. My experience in the gifted program was truly an eye-opener. Our fourth grade teacher was an energetic woman who came into school every day with something new. The think outside the box was the philosophy by which all her classes drove by. We didn't use textbooks. They were simply out of touch with the readers, boring, stressful, and impracticable. The difference now was that we were held to our own lofty standards rather than just, an, rather than just that of an academic status quo. And instead of spending hours in the classroom being talked to by a teacher, we created projects that enriched our learning and tackled real-life problems. 
To dive into the rich culture of ancient Mesopotamia in social studies, we had a fancy historical dinner of buttery bread, cheese and beef with juicy grapes, fresh vegetables and sparkling fruit wine by the side. Learning about government structures and functions, we were given the task of creating our own countries, including their national anthem, geographical location, constitutional laws, etc. The research that went into this was beyond phenomenal as we activated and engaged the lateral side of our thinking, not just the linear. News hit hard like a bolt from the blue. My family was returning back to Nigeria after about four and a half years of living in this beautiful foreign land I now called home. And so at the start of the 2018-2019 academic session, I was back where it had all started. Very easily, I switched back into my younger self ready to cram, memorize, and regurgitate. It turns out though, I still had my spark. Day in, day out, class after class, a cyclic pattern of define, list, explain, differentiate, mention, highlight. As junior Wayak and Neko exams approached towards the end of ninth grade, I studied harder than I ever did before. School hours stretched from 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. and Saturdays were no longer free. It was hectic, tense and stressful, but I managed to pull it off. On the final day of the exams, I vividly remember the huge celebration my friends and I had. We were excited, optimistic, eager to become sec senior secondary school students, but most of all, we felt relieved. We had even joked about burning our textbooks and notebooks as soon as we got home, relishing the satisfaction of naked flame licking every word we thought was useless to us now. It was finally over. But as I got home that day, I felt a sense of frustration, fatigue, and anger. All of the intense late night studying, the burnouts, the sleep deprivation, and the countless number of hours I dedicated towards this exam. And now, was it all a waste? Was anything gained? Could I really remember the things I'd been so quick to cram now that I was done? Could these hours have been tailored to meet a greater result? And yes, I knew about Yoruba festivals, the sacrifices, their gods, and what they like and didn't like. But was I any closer to learning how to speak my mother's tongue than I had before? I received a sterling A for business studies on my report card, but I still lacked the basic skills needed for personal finance management and entrepreneurship. Oh, but memorizing outdated content like shorthand techniques or the ethics of typewriting in today's modern economy was totally fine, right? As I began 10th grade, I had to make a very tough decision, one that we Nigerians are used to making as we approach this crucial stage, and that is to join either the art, commercial, or science department. With grades that flew off the chart, I was not restricted in choice, but I was unsure of which class to enter, and I wasn't alone. Statistics from the United States show that about a third of students, they don't know what career they want to pursue at this stage. And as students, the little knowledge we are exposed to comes from teachers' experiences, textbooks, online comments, so basically secondhand information. What if we could dive deeper, work with our hands, and gain experience? What if we took heads on with real project work that could actually be applied in real life scenarios? So recently, I took a survey of school teenagers asking what courses they would have loved to take in school in best preparation for their dream careers. Courses of time management, personal finance, handling relationships, navigating life as an adolescent, and finding and keeping a job dominated the survey responses. Schools fail to give attention to individual career ambitions because they're too busy focusing on academic achievement. If they really did, students would be equipped with the right resources needed to make key decisions about their future and gain exposure to the industries and work experience that matter most to them. School wouldn't be a generalized system, but a specific one. The problem is the current system of education was designed for a different age and a different time. In earlier generations, students were kept with the story that if you worked hard and did well and got a university degree, you would have a job. We don't believe that anymore. And the truth is, the gap between what employers are looking for and what schools are actually teaching is a far cry. So what's the way forward? Firstly, local and national employers must find a way to work with colleges nationwide to create a new curriculum that matches the requirements of industries, teaching relevant skills, and preparing young people for real-life employment. 
And yeah, I get that students need to understand what's being studied from a theoretical point of view. It is, after all, the foundation for building practical skills. But just doing that alone creates generation upon generation of passive, uninterested, linear, and restricted thinkers. Why don't we have an education system where emphasis is placed on active learning rather than standardized tests and scores? What if schools incorporated a wider range of learning experiences than lectures and exams? Let me round off with a quote by Jean Piaget. Education for most people means trying to lead the child to resemble the typical adult of his society. But for me and no one else, education means making creators. You have to make inventors, innovators, and not conformists. The, because we only have 18,720 hours, and it's up to every student, teacher, parent, school institution, and government to work hand in hand and achieve this. Thank you. Nimi Sonowo is from Lagos, Nigeria. She's 14 years old and spends her time thinking of ways to better her society. She enjoys playing the piano, swimming, and making an impact on the lives of people around her. She has given talks to people in her community and has an already published TED student talk. She's a student at Meadowhall College, Nigeria. Join me as we welcome our very own Nimi Sonowo as she shares habits. It was all planned out. Everything was precise. And therefore, like the little evil mastermind I was, I pulled it off without feeling an outer of guilt. Everything was fine until I did it again and again and again. And eventually, it became a natural occurrence. A thing that always happened every day when I always got back from school. And I always pulled it off, never a second too early nor a second too late. Sadly, I had missed something in my master plan. My mom, like the spark moron she is, would notice that the sweets seem to be decreasing every day when no one seemed to be taking the sweets. Obviously, something was not connecting. At least until that fateful day, when I heard her ask each of my siblings who had been taking no, stealing the sweets. My siblings were bewildered by her questioning until they saw my grief stricken face and said, Chai, Nimi has messed up again. A few weeks after it happened, and everything had returned to normal. I looked back and I thought, how had I allowed this to happen? Why had I fallen into this easy and simple trap? Well, bad habits and human beings have been best friends for a very long time. So is it even possible to break out of the spell of a bad habit? I'd like to say from my experience, to all of those who have lost hope and have accepted their bad habits as just their way of living, that the answer to that question is maybe. Maybe by the end of this talk, you'd have gathered enough self-motivation and inspiration to start the process of breaking this negative everyday habit. Or maybe by the end of this talk, you will leave feeling exactly the same way, with the same crushing weight of these bad habits on your back every day. It depends on you. The choice is yours. But I'm not only here to tell you my story, on how I broke free of my temptation, or to tell that you are going to be able to break free of your bad habits. I'm just here to give you a bit of hope that the fight doesn't always have to end with the bad habits coming out victorious. So, are you ready to get knee deep into your insecurities, break the bonds that your bad habits have created to hold you down, and finally live a life free of the guilt and shame derived from your negative habits? Okay, let's dive in. Firstly, let's start with the basics. What is a habit? And are all habits bad? Let's start with this. A habit is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard or difficult to give up. So we've established two things. A habit is something we often do without thinking. A study from Duke University in 2006 found that up to 45% of all our daily behaviors are automatic. Let me say that again. You spend one out of every two minutes doing something you're not even aware of. The second thing we've established is that habits are difficult to break or give up. Breaking bad habits and forming better ones is a type of learning, something we do throughout our entire lives. We need to learn how to learn 
and unlearn. Now for the second question, are all habits bad? The answer to that question is simply no. What comes to your mind when you hear the word habit? Maybe what comes to mind is a bad behavior that needs to be corrected or something you do without thinking that isn't necessarily helping you achieve all your goals and ambitions. But positive habits are the basis of your success. While healthy habits are important for your overall well-being and make you feel good, good habits include the following like regular exercise, a balanced diet, punctuality, and keeping your promises. Now we've determined that one, a habit is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard or difficult to give up. And two, not all habits are negative and some could be the basis of your success. This brings me to my story. Ever since I was a child, I always had a strange relationship with habits, both the good and the bad. I always seemed to be keen on picking up every strange habit I encountered. Sometimes it could be as simple as biting my nails, to be as complicated as saying the word like before every word in my conversations. But you see, at some point in time, when I was 8 years old, I seemed to have picked up these strange habits. And for some time, doing that didn't bother anyone. I was only 8 of course, and it was cute, and it didn't really affect me in any way. At least that was how the situation was, until I turned 10, and something finally ticked, and my parents were suddenly against this habit. I, as a 10 year old child I was, was perplexed. My mom and dad had never complained about this before. Why had they suddenly started screaming at me all day, trying their best to make me stop doing that bad, ha bad habit? My mom and dad reached new heights trying to get me to break that habit. At first, they started with small things, like talking to me about it, and trying to discourage me from doing it. When that didn't work, they upped their game a little bit, and started giving me punishment whenever they saw me doing the habit. Soon enough, my entire house had been turned into an episode of Tom and Jerry. You know the one where there's a cat chasing the mouse. Except in my case, I had two cats chasing one mouse and the punishment was far worse. I would be scolded. Now I'm sure you're expecting me to say that after my mom and dad punished me severely, I finally broke that horrid habit. And that was that. Sadly, no. That was not that. Yes, they talked to me. In fact, they threatened me and tried their best to make me see the error in my ways. But as a stubborn child I was, I simply didn't understand why this thing was terrifying them so much. I simply didn't understand how I was single-handedly destroying my life. And the funny thing is that eventually they stopped. They stopped their punishments, they stopped their threatenings, they stopped their talks. And I entered this world why I thought this habit that would destroy me was simply a part of me that I had to learn to accept. That was until my sister sat me down and told me the facts. She explicitly explained to me how this habit was controlling and slowly destroying my life. Then she told me the choice was mine. Maybe I did feel in exactly the same way with the crushing weight of these bad habits on my back every day. Or maybe I would live maybe i would gather enough self-motivation and inspiration to start the process of breaking my negative habits that it all depended on me that day i learned that the choice was mine i could choose to begin my journey i could choose to break the bonds i could choose to be free of my shame i could choose to live a life free of my bad habits i must say the journey was not easy it was a horrible experience, which actually required self-control and discipline. But I persevered, reminding myself of why I was doing this, to break free of the power that my habit held over me. And flash forward two years and here I am, free of my habits, free of my fear, free of my shame. I'm a living testimony that yes, you can break a habit you've had for the past five years. Yes, you can elevate past that behavior. Yes, you can and you will forge your own path, not dependent on your not determined, not dependent on a habit, but determined by you. You can be free, free to think of endless possibilities that don't end with you being degraded to this. You can be free, free of this so-called bliss, free from this endless game of hit and miss, 
free to stir off that axis but it's something you have to practice it takes time and energy to do this but hey i'm only here to show you the way to give you a glimmer of hope a glimpse of a future that doesn't follow the usual trope a future that isn't notorious a future where we can actually come out victorious thank you Toluwani Mi Tunde Ajala is a hard-working, social, and resourceful Year 8 student at Meadowhall College. She was a school valedictorian at her graduation from primary school and is currently maintaining her spot on the merit list at Meadowhall. In addition, she was an admirable performer of songs and dances. Apart from her studies and school-related works, she enjoys singing, dancing, reading, and working with children and animals. She aspires to attain a medical degree and connect her passion for mental health to the world in the future. She's speaking on the importance of online safety. Even though most of our everyday endeavors have now been moved online, I believe that safety remains a priority as the, in the physical world just as in the online world. Because the online world, while super interesting and relaxing, holds a lot more dangers than in the physical world. Hi, my name is Tolman Mitin Diajala and I'm here to talk about the importance of online safety. We are in an age where technology is rapidly advancing and there is a need for children and youth to be online, not just because of their studies, but for social and exploration purposes. According to a survey conducted on enough.org between kids in grade 4 to 8, 53% revealed their home addresses to a stranger. 21% spoke by phone with a stranger. 15% tried to meet with a stranger. 11% met a stranger in their houses at a stranger's house, a park, or a restaurant. 30% texted a stranger from their phones. Six and 6% revealed their home addresses to a stranger. These are all as a result of going online without being properly educated and monitored. Don't get me wrong, being online is great and meeting new people online is just as great. But maybe when it's online, there should be a certain boundary because for all you know, this person may be aligned about their age, identity, and even without that, you don't know their true intentions. Even meeting, though meeting someone you talk to online, content you search up online or get involved in online may not be safe for the user. The internet is accessible from almost anywhere with potentially harmful content available at any time without any restrictions. Children could discover and see sites with non-age friendly content, which is very dangerous, not for, just for the users, but also for their mental health. The internet, the internet features many threats and challenges, which can be manifested through grooming, harassment, cyber bullying, and offensive or unsafe content. Again, if youth are exposed to this content, it could have a lot of negative impact. However, creating awareness can protect from some of these dangers of being online, such as oversharing. Children like to explore new things, and I'm sure during this COVID period, a lot of kids were excited to get online. Some kids may not know what oversharing is. Some children, and given access to phones and social media, they start posting a lot of stuff, including home addresses, school addresses, which is not safe. However, on education, children will learn what is and what is not to be shared. Cyberbullying. Cyberbullying can have a disastrous effect on a child. Being online and posting content, or with, even, without being post, with, even without posting content, children, and children are constantly being targeted and bullied for a post or something even as minor as their age. Cyberbullying is a big problem and it has had a lot of negative impact on many children all around the world. Sexual predators. This is one of the greatest dangers of being online. Young, innocent and vulnerable children are often being targeted and threatened with unfriendly content and pedophilic behavior. Yes, this is more frequent in the physical world and a lot of you might be thinking, how is that even possible online? A lot, a lot of pe people go online and send a lot of children or even adult users a lot of unsafe and dangerous content. Hackers. Although skilled, these technological geniuses use their skills to get your personal information to achieve or overcome their obstacles. These people can even insert or install malware into your laptop, which can cause damages to one's laptop. Similar to hacking, phishing attempts are 
mostly sent by emails, to try to get your personal information or install malware. It's the type of fraudulent message to trick people into submitting their personal information or to get access into one's computer, and it is often sent by emails. There are many more threats online, but this could also be prevented by maintaining strong passwords. Thanks to Google, we now have a new application that allows us to, that allows us to get strong passwords, which are unguessable, and is only saved on our Google accounts. We also need to be beware, beware of physical phishing attempts because many of these are sent through our email and without, even without our knowledge, we can easily click on these sites. But if a site looks suspicious to you and it's sent to you through your email, don't click on it. This is most likely to be a phishing attempt. Do not submit personal information anywhere on the internet. Yes, you might sign up for something like a speech, a a speech, a training, you can sign up for a webinar online, but it, it gets to a point where some sites ask you for your password. If, if a site does this, do not impute your password. You also must ensure to practice safe browsing and maintain privacy settings. This being said, it is important to educate our children and youth about online safety and also create awareness of its importance to protect against the dangers of being online. Thank you. Elena is a year 11 student at British International School, Lagos. She is a prefect, was the chair of the school council and a debate member. As a debate member, she led the team in state competitions. She was also a member of the Model UN, responsible for conducting detailed research and writing opening speeches. Elena enjoys drama and has written and directed plays for events. She has been an independent student of Lambda for many years. Elena is currently on grade 7 of 8 and has recited written works at festivals and community events. In 2020, Elena entered the Boston Consulting Group's national essay, Writing Competitions, and received a formal commendation for her entry. Her passion for writing also led her to join the newspaper club. Currently, Elena is the head of Nigerian operations for an organization named Youth Promise. She is a gymnastic silver medalist and enjoys reading, swimming, and skating. My grandma is a kind, funny, optimistic old lady. It's weird how we can see the same person but make different observations. She's always been kind and caring, but has always had a firm stance on education. One of her favorite sayings is read your book. As a child, she wants to run and have fun. Hearing the words read your book is not the most exciting. I've heard this so much, in fact, as I stand here telling you this story, I can hear her saying read your book in the back of my mind. I know when I call her and tell her about this talk, the conversation will probably go, study, pass, look after everyone, and that's right, you guessed it, read your book. My grandma was forced to leave formal education early, and at 18, she'd moved to England. Imagine moving country, not being able to read and write properly. Because the opportunity to finish her education was snatched away from her, my grandma has always valued education more than most. She taught herself to read and write, which she can do in more than one language, and is financially astute. Although I sometimes think the financial literacy part is more down to her Nigerian DNA rather than arithmetic. Because it did not come easy, my grandma's thirst for knowledge was passed down to my mum, who chose to pursue further education and is a first generation graduate with two master's degrees. Three words that felt like nagging now had a whole new meaning. Read your book reminds us not everyone is lucky enough to have books and access to education. Therefore, we should value and cherish it more. Perhaps we have a moral obligation to help the educationally disfranchised. 76 million Nigerian adults are illiterate. On the 7th September 2021, this was the headline of an article published by Tribune. The article went on to say 38% of Nigerian population cannot read or write despite increasing efforts to improve literacy levels in the country. At a news conference marking the 2021 International Literacy Day celebration. The Minister of Education made it known that in addition to the poor literacy rate, 6.9 million children are not in school. In Nigeria, education is not free. It is costly and inaccessible. Some do not have the opportunity to receive an education, whether formal or non-formal. Some are forced to begin work or travel long distances to get to school. Illiteracy and lack of education is a global issue. That is why 
the sustainable development goal is to ensure inclusive and equitable inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning for all. Even those who go to school face issues. Globally, two thirds of children are in school and will reach the final grade of primary school, but will not achieve minimum proficiency levels in reading. 137 million adolescents, about 60%, are in school, but not learning. Many confuse learning with education. We go to school to receive a formal education, but education and learning are very different. As my grandma has demonstrated, informal education is also powerful. My dad has always said some of the most intelligent people he's ever met have never stepped foot in a classroom. Same way some of the dumbest people he's ever met. Well, he catches drift. For example, we learn about physics and velocity and speed in school. However, it wasn't until I went headfirst flying into a tree while riding my bike and laughing at my brother that I understood the true value of slowing down and always having one hand on the brake. That coupled with my mom's scolding was enough to teach me a lesson. Don't you love African parents? <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is that education can exist outside of formal structures. Informal education is also powerful. And who knows, this may spark a quest for learning and lead to formal education further down in the line. The function of education is to teach one to think in intensively and critically. Martin Luther King. Education is not the learning of facts but the training of the mind to think, Albert Einstein. What Martin Luther King and Albert Einstein are talking about is the disconnect between education and learning. They're talking about the soft and transferable skills which the World Economic Forum says are needed for the 21st century workplace. These include critical thinking, creativity, judgment, problem solving, and coordination with others. Currently, not all of these skills are being taught in all schools. After sitting my final, school, my final secondary school math exam, all I could think about was how I had this knowledge in my head that I was no longer using, and how there were people in similar situations to my grandma. I thought about how much I had learned from the many excellent teachers I had the privilege to learn from over the years. Perhaps it was time to give back. Last summer, I joined Youth Promise. Youth Promise, YP for short, is an organization providing free virtual tutoring to underserved youth across the globe. They were formed during the pandemic to help those who do not have the resources to reach their full potential. Success is their mission. Their services aim to empower students using individual classes, group classes, and college and test prep courses, taught by their qualified volunteers. Also, did I mention that Youth Promise is run by teenagers and young adults like myself? And they're relatively new. However, with a clear goal, this one profit has expanded and has helped so many people in such a short amount of time. Everyone is so kind and friendly and passionate about what they do. For example, not everyone in Youth Promise is in the same time zone. This means staying awake and helping people across continents to provide support. I've done it and I can tell you it's not easy. Not only does this show passion, but commitment and dedication. Also, while Youth Promise tutors students in subjects like math, English and science, they also take extra courses and encourage tutors with hobbies and interests to teach what they know and enjoy. They have, these classes stem from things like art, to public speaking, to even life skills. And they occasionally hold events, the most recent being a Christmas drive to give underprivileged children gifts for Christmas. Essentially, Youth Promise is an example of children teaching children. I think this is great and should be promoted more because it has so many advantages. For example, it's scalable. This means a large number of, of children can be reached in a short amount of time. It is relatively cheap as it does not require brick and mortar structures, which tend to be costly. It is accessible as we can reach children in hard to reach areas using technology. Also, on occasion, I've noticed that children tend to empathize more with other children than adults. And both parties benefit from this. Tutors benefit from tutoring as well. Tutoring can help to build confidence, communication skills, and emotional intelligence, which are all skills needed for the future. Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. He also said, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. He's right. However, for this to happen, it has to be accessible worldwide. Youth Promise has now begun outreaching. 
I was lucky enough to be chosen to be head of Nigerian operations. What I'm ashamed to say is that I fell asleep before my first meeting, I woke up an hour later asking where the Zoom link was. I'm still embarrassed to this day. However, I look forward to doing more with Youth Promise and organizations like it. It was empowering to hear a student say to me, I learned something. I also hope to eventually set up my own organization. Now, I'm not asking everyone who sees this talk to set up their own organization or become a teacher by profession. But, I, but I'm asking those who have access to education to find innovative ways of sharing it. A teacher's job is to impart knowledge. A teacher told me that. We can all be great teachers. I believe it is our jobs as students, especially those who have attended formal education, to share this knowledge. So please, read your book and share your knowledge with just one other person so we can tackle the challenges of illiteracy together. It all starts with three words and one person.
impressive and amazing dance moves from Meadow Hall Junior School dance team. Itelua Kishi Adebayo is a God-fearing, academic-driven, and extremely talented young lady. She dreams of owning a successful business enterprise and plans to establish a charity that caters to providing support to the less fortunate in many ways. Itelua Kishi is an avid reader. She plays the piano and enjoys photography and acting. She also volunteers to causes that she is passionate about. Itelua Kishi has also won many awards and recognitions. From the Honorable Academic Award at her high school to the Kirby's Ecofilm Participation Award, she is constantly pushing herself out of her comfort zone and this drive created the opportunity to be one of the speakers at a conference co-sponsored by the British Council on Climate Change and Environmental Education for Children and she is now on the TEDx stage. Itelo Akishi aspires to win more awards and make a mark on the world. Join me as we welcome Itelo Akishi Adebayo as she shares quality education for all. Did you know that in 2015, the total number of illiterate adults reached 745.1 million? Yes, 745.1 million. That is more than twice the population in Egypt. Did you know that around the world, 59 million children of primary school age are being denied an education and almost 65 million adolescents are without access to a secondary school? A high number of children and adults do not have access to education for many different reasons. One, they might not have the means to pay for their education. Two, there isn't a school in their neighborhood. And three, they have to take part in vocational or labor activities to bring income into the family. Quality education is a term that is used very widely in our everyday conversations. We hear it on the radio, we see it in newspapers, and we might even hear our parents discussing it. But what does this phrase really mean? What does it mean when I say that I am advocating for quality education or that every single child deserves quality education? Many people believe that the definition of quality education is an excellent school or educational institution. This is why many schools and education institutions say that they provide quality education. And this is correct, but only at the surface level. Quality education is much deeper than that. Quality education is a lot deeper than the fact that you can produce brilliant results from your students or that you boast of a high number of graduates. According to ASCD, the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development, quality education is one that focuses on the whole child the social, emotional, mental, physical, and cognitive development of each student, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or geographic location. It prepares the child for life, not just for testing. I remember that at a very young age, I've always wanted to help. I wanted to be the reason that someone's situation was improved, or the reason why there was a smile on another person's face. When I was in year six, at the age of 10, I volunteered along with some friends to teach at a primary school in Makoko, Lagos, Nigeria. For some context, this school was situated in a very dilapidated environment. We taught there for a couple of days, and the subjects that we focused on were maths, English, and science. I must confess that the opportunity to teach at Makoko was an eye-opening, mind-shifting game changer to my 10-year-old self. I had a first-hand glimpse of what a poor education system looked like, and the experience exposed me to many life lessons. I learned things that I would not have been able to learn if not for that experience. It was an unforgettable one. In fact, I still look back on it sometimes and I get teary-eyed. I learned that education should be a priority. I learned that there is power in the fact that you can pass knowledge onto one person who passes it on to another person. Most importantly, I learned that children love to learn. In fact, children really, really want to learn. But, and here is the but, they don't have the opportunity to. And when the opportunity does present itself, it's supper. So what exactly is the problem? Why is it that some children are spending all their time working in a shop rather than being in school learning? Or why is it that almost every day when we take a drive out, we see young children on the streets hawking instead of being in a school, broadening their minds? Or the fact that when a child even gets to go to school, it's in a rundown building that isn't sanitary, neither is it safe. Do we not see a problem with the fact that around 617 million youth worldwide lack basic mathematics and literacy skills? The United Nations says, and I quote, that education enables upward socioeconomic mobility and is a key to escaping poverty. Lack of access to education is one of the major reasons why poverty is passed from one generation to another. Global Citizen says that increasing access to, educa to education can equalize communities and help to provide financial stability to some. 
a lot of families live in poverty, so they have to make the, the very important decision on whether to send their children to school or pay for basic necessities. And most times, the latter choice is made, which is very understandable. Hence, some countries across the sub-Saharan Africa, where some of the world's poorest children live, made a combined effort to abolish school fees. Statistics from Global Citizen state that while the ratio of students completing lower secondary school increased in the region from 23% in 1990 to 42% in 2014, enrollment is still low compared to the 75% global ratio, which simply means that school still remains too expensive for the poorest of families. In many areas where there is a lot of crisis and they are still underdeveloped, unaffordable private schools may be the only option. So now many people have started to argue that free schools should be allocated in some countries where there are no schools or where the schools are not in good shape. There are three key pillars that support quality education. One, access to quality teachers. Two, use of quality learning tools and professional development, which includes access to technology. And three, the establishment of safe and supportive quality learning environments. These three criteria must be met. The concept behind us achieving quality education is that it must be a collaborative effort. The government, the private sector, corporate organizations, and all citizens have a role in achieving this goal. But the first step would be to acknowledge the fact that quality education is an important part of sustainable development. To not be blindsided by our own personal comfort, but to be aware. For us to not think that because this does not directly affect us, we just sit down and do nothing. We must remember that without quality education, the citizens do not grow to their fullest potential. And this snowballs into society is stagnant. For us to not think that because this does not directly affect us, we just sit down and do nothing. Desmond Tutu said, inclusive good quality education is a foundation for dynamic and equitable societies. We must remember that without good quality education, the citizens do not grow to their fullest potential. And this snowballs into society is stagnant. Thank you. I bet you thought that was all we had for you today, but that's definitely not even a tip of what we have planned for today. Right now, I'll be listening to one of Meadowhall's phenomenal lyricist, Myra Arbruth, as she comes to give us her very own rap rendition. When you come out of the water I'm a believer, my heart is fleshy Life is short with a temper like Joe Pesci They always come and see me crazy, your name is catchy But they don't see you how I see you, calling me Desi Cross team tween, Essie, hit the jet ski When they get messy, go lefty like Lionel Messi Let's take a trip and get the best bus or in the jet ski I know the stuff we got the best week, we go next week I wanna, I wanna honor you Ross Boo, man, my father's child I know when the sun takes the first step, the father's proud If you make it to the water, he'll part the clouds I know he made you a snack like I can brown So for me to pieces, now I gotta clean it up Formalizing you in community, we can trust I know I ain't Please help me, God. I feel so alone. I'm just a kid. I can't take you on my own. I got so many tears in right in the song. Can't fit in with you. I feel alone. I wake up every day. The one in my home. My mom is asking me why I'm always alone. I'm scared to say. I'm scared to holler. I'm walking to school with sweat around my collar. I'm just a kid. I don't want no stress. The nerves are bad. My life's a mess. The names you call me, they help me bad. I wanna tell my mom, but she's having trouble with my dad. I feel so sad. There's nowhere to turn. Come to school, don't let me cry, I'm gonna learn So please, if you please, come walk, don't you know I have a dad? Cause I'm hopeful, yes I am hopeful for two days Take me music and you say, let me thank you and pray And you hopeful, hopeful, and you make a way I know you can be ready, but that's okay Look, you fuck me, God, I feel so alone I'm just a kid, I can't take you on my own Bad. My life's a mess, the means you call me, they hurt me bad I wanna tell my mom, but she's having trouble with my dad I feel so sad, there's no one to turn Come to school, don't wanna fight, wanna learn Please, if you breathe, tell me why I'm done You know I have a dad
I'm Cause I'm hopeful Yes, I am hopeful Today, so this music can be great Let it take you to fight And be hopeful, hopeful And you make a way I know it's easy, but That's okay, so I'm hopeful Yes, I am hopeful So today, so this music can be great Let it take you to fight It's all I have, so I'm just pulling it from the past. So I'm just pulling it, help me please. I'm flesh and blood, accept me please. Ikena Unwafo is a student at the Waterman College. He's as versatile as he is a member of the drama group and he's referred to as an ardent actor by his drama teacher. He's always ready to learn and his leadership qualities are splendid as he owns up to duties and he's prompt to take responsibilities. His explicit explanation of concepts earn him the desired respect, not just from his teachers, but also from his peers. Join me as we welcome Ikena and Wanfo as he gives his TED talk on leadership. Let me take you through a short life experience. They say the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. My first step was five years ago. What do you think attending a glamorous school would look like? The most developed science labs? State of the art infrastructure and digital facilities? The most encyclopedic students from all over the country and the globe? That was a question that existed in my imagination a few years back. Something I could only dream of or read about in books. It was basically a fairy tale to me. So it was a mere matter of trying my luck when I picked up that application form to apply for the Day Waterman Scholarship. And oh, I don't think you can even imagine the uncontainable excitement of being, a, of being one of the very few, very, very few lucky ones to be accepted for this scholarship. I was overjoyed. I basically dashed into my parents' room with joy written all over my face and pride in my shoulders as I held that little piece of paper and showed them with pride. Yes, victory, victory, victory. As expected, they wished me the best of luck in my endeavors and the smoothest transition into secondary school. But that transition was very far from smooth. Walking into the campus on that fateful afternoon for the first time ever, I gazed in awe at the beauty of the surrounding all around me. While suddenly taking mental note of the myriad of luxurious cars, Rolex watches, Gucci shoes adorned by my pairs and their families. Wow! It was like a contest of designer brand wristwatches, shoes, you name it. I mean, what was the brand of my black leather hand-me-down shoes again? I don't think they were the original, much less of having a branded tag on them. I quickly became conscious to the affluence I was visibly surrounded by. And slowly but surely, I felt intimidated by that affluence every single time. I was drowning in an ocean of my constant comparison of myself to my mates. My pairs and their family were obviously the beneficiaries of an existing class system that comes along with society. Let's face it, there are some benefits society throws at the upper class, not meant for the lower class or the, even the middle class, and are the mere figment of the imagination of people like me. For instance, most of my mates could afford to travel out and spend their vacation at any place of their choosing as often as they wanted to or at least as often as their parents wanted them to. 
that was an unimaginable luxury to me. For the first two years of my stay at Day Waterman College, I lived the basic life of an average student. I attended classes when I needed to. I did my homework like any other student would. And I watched life pass by with my arms folded. I was all too scared to come out from being a bystander and be discriminated against for what I was. A scholarship student, undeserving of education at such a wonderful and prestigious institution. So it was painful, definitely. A very painful experience. Tears rolled. Altercations were bound to come. And some even made mockery of my humble background. But I wasn't faced. I was exhausted of being in my shell. So I had to come out. I had to come out from that shell. Yes, it was a Herculean task. And it took me most of my time, my sweat, and my energy to come out of that show I had been for two years. But I came out and demonstrated who I was or who I had been taught to be. Right from an early age, I had been taught to stand out, even if it meant standing alone. I had been taught that hard work and perseverance were the keys to success even if it meant making a huge amount of sacrifices to attain whatever you wanted to attain. That was me. That was what made me me. So when my friends were off at an exotic location, learning and exploring the beauties of those places, I also did my own explore, exploration through books, through the pages of books, as I felt and sensed the vivid descriptions of those places and my trips. When my mates were busy relaxing during their free time, I spent my free time learning how to be confident, working on my public speaking skills and my conversational skills, developing myself from time to time. And today, I can sit back, be proud, look down the lane of where I've come from and be proud of it, to say that I am the first ever scholarship student to be the head boy of D. Waterman College, and I am grateful for that. Today, I stand in front of you, retelling my experience like a soldier, proudly clutching his crest and waving his emblem, who upon seeing his medals, acknowledges the blood and the sweat that have come through in bringing him thus far. I cannot say my journey is over. Definitely not. It is just the beginning of many more to come. But whenever I cast my mind back to the huge amount of sacrifices that have brought me this far, I am consumed with tears of joy and proud of my background, which had taught me to stare down at life challenges and laugh. Because I know the only way from here is forward. Forever free. Vanya Bandri is a year 11 student at the British International School. She enjoys participating in arts and sports. She is a prefect who has participated in various competitions for football, tennis and table tennis and always loves playing new sports. She is an artist and loves sketching as well as painting watercolours. Debating competitions and speeches have always been interesting to her. Along with this, she enjoys psychology and hopes to pursue it. Join me as we welcome Vanya Bandri as she shares her TED talk on change. Change. I know that just by hearing that word, some people may get stressed. Anxiety, trepidation, fear, loneliness. Isn't that what comes with change? Isn't that the reason we don't want things to change? The first thing I want to do today is break down the word change. What is it? Change is something different. It's an alteration, a modification. Change is something new. But most importantly, change is natural. It keeps happening again and again on a daily basis. The change of seasons, months, and even something as small as changing clothes. 
change is everywhere. So why are we, as humans, so averse to it? Why do we fear change? Most of us tend to follow this idea. Do the normal, stay away from the unknown. We have a routine, and if something disrupts that routine, if something changes, we tend to stress ourselves out and overthink it, which is a perfectly normal reaction to change, don't get me wrong. But why can't we look at change as something good? Why can't we take on the challenges that change throws at us out of nowhere and say, I'm ready for this. I can do this. I know you must be thinking, why should I be open to change when I can just enjoy what I have now and stay in my comfort zone? I can tell you from personal experience that change can be really good, especially when embraced. Actually, I'd say change is one of the main reasons I am who I am today, and it has taught me so many things that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. I've changed six schools in 12 years, so changing schools has always been a constant for me. But one of my biggest changes happened in early 2017, around January, when as a 10-year-old, I moved across the world from India to Nigeria, a country I'd never been to and a continent I'd never been to. I had to adjust to a new culture, new food, new languages and dialect, new friends, and a new school environment. I was suddenly supposed to fit into this new regime and go to this new school daily. But I'd say one of the main reasons my experience of settling into Nigeria was better than expected was because of my mindset. My family and I were excited to move and we were looking forward to all the experiences that was, were in store for us. Most of us enjoyed the food. Of course, that includes jollof rice and soya. And I can easily say that Nigerian jollof is better than Ghanaian jollof. I was introduced to a whole new genre of music and even met Paul Okoye from Peace Square. Along with changing continent, many other things were different. For example, I had never stayed in an apartment with a pool right downstairs before. And I had never had a chance to learn another language, which was French. Talking to and understanding the people around me wasn't a big problem after a few weeks, but the main difference was my school. The learning board was very different to the one I was used to. As soon as I realized that in the school I was in, people usually leave after year six, I thought I was going to make friends who I was going to know just for six months. But now I'm still in touch with them, many of them. Fast forward to two years later, I had to suddenly move back to India to a new school for just one year. Although I had stayed in the city before, I moved to a new school with not one familiar face. And on top of that, a new curriculum and board of learning, again. After the one year's time, I came back to Nigeria and you guessed it, moved to a new school. This time though, I felt like I was back home. But the COVID-19 pandemic had started a few months before this and so, everything was different. I'm sure we all know what that was like. Online school, online work for some, masks, restrictions, lockdowns, and a lack of knowledge about the virus that made it an unknown common enemy. A few months after being back, I contracted the dreaded virus and had to isolate in my room for 13 days. Suddenly, I wasn't allowed to play any sports or do anything that could put extra pressure on my lungs. Slowly, around two months later, I started getting back to sports and bought myself a skateboard and broke my foot. Of course, my parents didn't want me to get a skateboard in the first place because they predicted something like this might happen. But after months of convincing, they gave in. From being an active kid who did two hours of sports per day, I was restricted to a pair of scratches and a heavy cast on my foot. Anyway, I feel like these constant changes in my life have built my personality, especially by increasing resilience, adaptability, and giving me a more open-minded and curious outlook on life. But enough about the changes in my life. Why should you embrace change? These are my reasons for befriending and embracing change. Change teaches you appreciation and gratefulness. You learn to love what you have, and be happy with it and thankful for it. Change teaches you to be open-minded. You learn to listen and understand. Change makes you adaptable. 
you work with what you have and make the best of it. Change comes with opportunities. You use your resources to the fullest and try to achieve the best. Change makes you resilient. You get beaten down, but you get back up. This time with a little extra experience. Change helps you grow. You get experience, knowledge, and discover more about yourself along your journey of changing. Change is vital, and change can be embraced. Let's take a second to look back and think of a time where something big happened in your life, a big change. How did you handle it? Do you think you could have handled it better? And do you think it helped you in any way? And finally, what does change mean to you? At this point in the event, we'd like to welcome the lead organizer for TEDx Youth at Meadow Hall, Mr. Benga Samo, for his closing remark. Wow, what an amazing session we've had today. Listening to these 10 speakers uh, from both Meadow Hall and other international schools in Lagos. And that's the great thing about TED Talks and about TED itself, giving children an opportunity to share the big ideas, think critically, and curate their own talks. I want to say a big thank you to all our student speakers today because indeed they have worked extremely hard to make these presentations today. What a great theme we've also had this year, reimagine. And there's no better time than now to reimagine learning, to reimagine a lot of things about how we act and what we do. And that's what the children have shared today. What a great time we've had. I want to say a big thank you to the founder and CEO of Meadow Hall Group, Dr. Kende Wani, for giving the children an opportunity to express themselves, share their big thoughts, and fulfill their potential. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you for everyone for sitting back to listen and digest their big, big ideas. And from every one of us at Meadow Hall, we are so glad that you could join us today, not just on our second TEDx event, but our 20th anniversary TEDx event. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you next year. A big thank you to all Asian schools and other schools from which we had speakers, such as the Waterman, Princeton International School, Accra, Juilliard School, and BIS. We say a big thank, thank you. you. So we've come to a wrap of today's event. So, Polo, what did you think of today? I think it was way better than last year's. Oh, I do too. So thank you everyone for joining us. See you next year. Bye! Bye.